So for those who are with us tonight right now, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Please know that this meeting is being recorded. I'm Juliana Ferrero. I'm consulting creator for the Cultural Affairs Department for the city of Pompano Beach. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's program. In tonight's artist talk, we're hosting Lisa Rockford and Senaz Masinani. Lisa Rockford is the founder of Rockford Projects and as an independent curator, she has been very active in the South Florida creative community, organizing several exhibitions, workshops, public programs, and interactive experiences. Lisa is a curator for the exhibitions Camouflage, Patterns of Disruption on view at Bailey Contemporary Art Center through September 24th. Sanaz Masinani is an artist featuring this exhibition, joining us tonight from Canada. Lisa and Sanaz, welcome. Thank you. So I will introduce Sanas. Uh, so Sanas Maznani is an artist, educator, and curator based in Toronto. Working across the disciplines of photography, sculpture, and large-scale multimedia installations, Mazinani creates informational objects that invite a rethinking of how we see, suspending the viewer between observation and knowledge. Informed by the visual rhetoric and confounding presence of contemporary media circulation, her multidisciplinary practice aims to politicize the prolif proliferation and distribution of images, invite critical reflection, and forefront social justice and environmental movements. In previous projects, Mazinani has explored and researched how repetition and pattern making can help to make information legible. This allows for knowledge sharing with the possibility to alter people's ideologies. Looking at forms of state control, Mazinani's projects consider how revisualizing embedded power structures can interrupt them. In aestheticizing informational systems, Mazinani contributes to a larger understanding of how conflicting realities are constructed and how they can be reconfigured as a form of activism through art. As a mother, a racialized digital artist, and an environmentalist, Mazinani focuses on imagining the communicative possibilities of visual language to make visible marginalized narratives. Her years living in Iran provided her with a deep commitment to the representation of historically invisible perspectives. Sanaz holds an undergraduate degree from Ontario College of Art and Design and an MFA from Stanford University. Her work has appeared in solo exhibitions at institutions, including the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, the West Vancouver Museum, and Triton Museum of Art in Santa Clara, California. Her projects have been featured in venues throughout Canada, as well as China, France, Germany, Guatemala, India, Iran, Switzerland, the UAE, UK, and USA. Mazanani's work has been written about in Art Forum, Artnet News, Border Crossings, Canadian Art, San Francisco Chronicle, Washington Post, among others. Sanas has received grants from the Canada Council, Zellerbach Family Foundation, and National Endowment for the Arts, and her work is held in public collections, including the Canada Council Art Bank, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the City County of San Francisco. So please welcome Sanas. Thank you so very much, Lisa. Thank you, um, Juliana and um, everyone <laughs> at the amazing Art Center for inviting me to be part of the whole experience of being in the show. And uh, I was really sad that I couldn't come. I really wanted to, but uh, maybe next time. <laughs> and also just to be able to engage on this level uh, with uh, your members. So I'm going to share a slideshow, talk for about, I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then take some questions. I would really love to hear your thoughts. And I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And um, uh, let's see how this goes. OK, so I would like to actually begin uh, by uh, noting my gratitude to be living and working in Toronto, also known as Tecoranto, as an uninvited guest. 
Today, Tacaranto is home to many indigenous people and is the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I am thankful for the thousands of years of stewardship of this land, which allows me to be able to live and work here. I'm here today in Tacaranto and far away from my own native land due to the deep and systemic forces of colonialism that have mined my country's resources and destabilized our region for oil and power. Forcing Iran into an eight-year-long war with our neighbors. As a result, my family was forced to immigrate here from Iran in December of 1988, just before my 11th birthday. I stand in solidarity with indigenous people and their collective struggle for sovereignty. And I'm just going to drop this. Oh, can I do this? Uh, maybe uh, I'll drop the, a little link into the chat in a few minutes um, about um, after I finish talking about uh, where you can look up um, what native land you are residing on today, because there's so many beautiful names to the different cultures. Um, so again, I really want to thank Lisa so very much for imagining this uh, creative exhibition and being the force behind it all and to the team uh, for making it happen. So, um, and most importantly, I should say uh, the viewers for being here and listening to me uh, talk about the work. So I just want to start by um, spending a couple of minutes to give you a brief introduction uh, into my practice. I've been making work for about 18, 20 years, and I've made stuff in uh, different media from photography to video art, sound, scent, I made a scent once, um, installation, sculpture, and um, what has uh, become uh, clear to me over these years is that there is like this overarching theme and it happens often to be the theme of photography. So I'm especially interested in how we can think about the photographic medium, not only as an image, but also as information or as data, something that frames our understanding of the world. Um, I was first moved to understand the incredible power of the image, and I guess today we can kind of think about video um, and its power. Uh, during my first trip to Iran when I was 15 years old, so I had been living in Canada for four years prior to that and first went back after four years at the age of 15. And there I realized for the first time that who I was and what my culture was was being perceived uh, within a very specific context of an immigrant from the Middle East. Prior to that, um, I'd never even called where I was from Middle East. It was always a part of Asia. And I started realizing that so many of these things were constructs and that the perception of me was not formed only by my interactions with other people, but also but what, uh, on what other people understood about my culture from what they gleaned from the media, what was shown to them. So I realized that photography is quite powerful, um, but that simultaneously as it can give us knowledge and information about places we've never been or times we've never could vi revisit, it also had limitations in that what it left out of the picture, what was the complexity of the picture that could not be uh, presented. So this is the first project that came out of, I think this like many, many years of thinking through these ideas. And uh, I titled it Frames of the Visible. Um, the project was really about my fascination with the circulation of images, in particular due to uh, images that represent a conflict of war. And I wanted to know which pictures get printed in the newspapers. Why is one image being printed multiple times and others never being shared? So social media uh, was a key component of this work. Previous to this, which the project started in 2011, I had been downloading images slightly obsessively um, and just saving them almost like this like digital archive that I was keeping, always about conflict and war, and mostly about what was going on in the Middle East. 
uh, I felt this distance and I wanted to understand it more. And so when I decided to work on this project in 2011, at that time, I had about 60,000 images on my drive saved. They weren't taking up too much space because they were small, low resolution images. And so um, this is, you have to think about this, the timing of this. It's a little bit, the dates are a little bit old. But at this time, when I was looking at it in 2011, um, this was the equation of how many images were on Facebook compared to the Library of Congress. So thinking that there was over 10 times, the Facebook select image collection at that time was already 10 times larger than the Library of Congress. What did that mean in terms of which images are being circulated and seen? And this was just fascinating for me. Um, I also looked at uh, the numbers of photos taken and how that changed uh, per uh, year, like the dramatic shift of it. And again, thinking about this like almost 9% increase per year, how, um, what are the images that are being photographed and recorded and what's not being documented it became a question to me. Um, and mostly because I was on Facebook a lot at the time and I had different networks. So I had been living in Toronto and I had moved to San Francisco two years prior and had a network in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And of course I had old friends that I wanted to catch up with who had moved back to Iran or going back and forth. And so my Facebook feed or that bubble was very different than other friends. And I started thinking about this kind of movement of information and how something would circulate and repeat. Um, I also wanted to mention that as of this March, this uh, 2021, 35.6% um, of the world's population is using Facebook. That's about over, over a third of humans on earth use Facebook. Um, a lot more access than, again, if you want to compare it to something like the Library of Congress and what gets in there, right? So um, I really wanted to kind of create a depth into uh, my understanding of patterns and how I wanted to use it in my practice. And uh, my research came across um, a lot of um, uh, geometries of information and in particular led me to this very interesting uh, anthropological case study of uh, the Misinga region in central uh, KwaZulu um, on and what it was looking at is the continuity and the change of Zulu beadwork conventions so I'm looking at the interaction between color and pattern so in Zulu beadwork, the study showed that adornments um, were specifically carrying information with them that would uh, tell you something about who wore it. So made by women, these specific waistbands were for their partners or the men in their society. And depending on the pattern and the shape and the color of these bead be um, designs, you would be able to learn about who the person is. So the figure 5.3a shows an example of an unmarried man looking for a wife, whereas the um, B uh, version would be made by a wife of an older man, but it would be there to show respect and say that, you know, we actually have a great life together <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so uh, as, as an honor to him. So this line of inquiry um, really led me to um, imagine how I could represent patterns as a way for us um, in understanding one another and also in holding information. This is the first work that came out of um, that research and the title of the piece is called Together We Are. And of course, it, um, the subject of it relates to who I am. I was um, interested in figuring out a way to artistically 
visualize the transmission of images to represent the network and the nodes of connections, but to also put these images together in repeated format to draw attention to how they might exist online and how their repetition can result in the value that we give them. For example, if we see an image multiple times, might we start to think that it's important? Might we start to identify with it perhaps? Or believe that the content of it is more true? So when you get closer to the work, you start to actually see what each image is holding. And in this case, uh, it's pretty, um, uh, it's a pretty big contrast, I would say. But I also wanted to bring these two bodies, these two female bodies together because I see a similarity. What I see similar is the fact that um, each woman is removing an article of clothing. What I see is this uh, dichotomy between uh, someone wearing white and someone wearing black. Um, what I see is the reduction of these women into a singular representation of them. Someone like uh, Paris Hilton, uh, and she's kind of coming back in social in, in the news and stuff again, uh, but at the time she was quite popular. Mm. This, Paris Hilton is, has always been represented to us uh, incredibly singularly, very one-dimensional. She's a person, she is very complicated and she has her own life and her own family. And in opposition, this unnamed woman wearing the headscarf, the hijab, is wearing a belt of dynamite. I do not know her name. I do not know anything more about her. So what I found was really interesting is that how the photograph reduced each person to a singular way of being understood. And I found that in a way they had to come together to kind of share in that sadness in, in a certain way. So there's the work again. And I also wanted to mention the way that I made these pieces. Um, so they're actually on panels and the panels come together in four quadrants. And they're angled so that when you stand as a viewer right in front of the piece, um, the work uh, kind of fills in your peripheral vision. So in a way, um, kind of envelops you. And I, I was thinking about how we kind of fall into our social media feeds, let's say. So in addition to that type of imagery, I also used um, the series of photographs that were released in 2005. Um, a University of Delaware professor named Ralph Beglinger um, released uh, more than 700 of these military photographs from ceremonies honoring returning military dead. Um, the professor was able to get these images through a Freedom of Information Act request and um, was able to get them from the military. Although before they were released, all the kind of pertinent, let's say, information was um, redacted and blacked out. My concern was um, this media's uh, portrayal of the armed conflict and the fact that it is so integral to the way that we respond to war. I was wondering why are the casualties of war being uh, not properly uh, presented? Why are, the, uh, why are the families not being honored? And why are we not giving the correct amount of attention to this devastating loss of life? So I wanted to use these images, including the redacted faces. Oops. Why did I do that? I seem to have stopped my share. Okay, are we back on cue? Okay, <laughs> I don't know what I did. Um, I wanted to just point to the person standing here when I did that. Can you see my arrow? Um, so there's the yes. face being redacted. And in the back, if you could see a line of other men standing and of course the, the coffin. 
So I wanted to show that this is happening. Please let's not forget. And also why? Why are we making these images, um, rendering them in a way that they cannot be reproduced um, as easily in our media? Um, I made several pieces using this imagery and I was thinking about the value of the photograph. Does the photograph lose its um, meaning when we remove a part of it? How does um, the removal of the face, of the name, even the vehicle which, from which the um, people are coming out of, how does that affect the documenting element of the photograph? And um, so these were my questions for the work. Uh, this piece titled uh, Redacted March Number 3 uses two panels, but also includes a strip of mirror in the center of the work. And the idea is to implicate the viewer into the image. So when you're looking at it, you're seeing the soldiers, you're seeing the loss of life, and you're seeing yourself within that moment of uh, interaction. Uh, this piece is a little difficult to see, so um, you have to try kind of hard for it, but it's basically been um, inverted so that the white is black and the black is white and the red is green. <laughs> and um, there's two images. The second image, um, which is right on this side, is actually a young man dressed in army fatigues taking a self-portrait almost like in pride and there is a lot of pride of course um, to defend one's culture but i feel like there is a real issue when we don't address the full capacity of what happens uh, when uh, one begins conflict Simultaneously, I've always been very interested in uh, the kind of power of um, technology, the power of the military to create um, incredible machines. And so I've also been always collecting photographs of air shows. So this uh, work uh, was made out of a single image of the formation of blue angels. This pro uh, I still do, I should mention, make photographs. <laughs> and I did during this time. But because I wanted to talk about the images that we consume and how we come across them, it was really important for me to use only images that um, were already existing online and were kind of part of the vernacular of scrolling and being part of the internet world. So this piece is called How to Draw a Stealth Bomber. And I sourced this image from a step-by-step -step instructional guide for kids on how to draw different things such as dogs and cats and helicopters and of course fighter jets and such. And that, I thought, was important to be reflected in the title. Here's another piece that also includes a mirror. It was very, very hard for me to take this picture without having something else in the mirror being reflected. And now I regret it. I should have documented it with a person in there so you could see what's the reflective part. But you can imagine the center is this kind of bronze colored mirror. And uh, the detail is this. So I, I want to switch now over to the project that is in the exhibition. Um, it uh, is uh, something that has been uh, a project that's been ongoing for me for many, many years and um, has kind of come in and out of my practice a lot. It's resurfaced. It's uh, had has had iterations. So um, here is a detail of one of the scrolls that you have on exhibit, and this is the full scroll. They are printed on um, silk, 
And this was very important for me was to create a juxtaposition between what was being imaged and how we feel about it. In the same way that the aesthetics of it are both reflecting Islamic ornamentation, but also symmetry and beauty. Um, but there is always something kind of questionable in it. So um, uh, this kind of beautiful and tragic coming together. That's a detail. And then um, these are some thunderbirds flying in formation. I've always been interested in thinking about why we put energy towards certain solutions versus others. And um, I uh, think that by creating a space such as this one to talk about it allows us a chance to formulate alternative uh, ways of approaching um, problems. So inspired by the pieces that are currently in your show, uh, I made this work, which was actually reusing, um, I'm so sorry, can you guys hear the dog? Sorry, <laughs> very excited dog outside. Okay, um, so since, uh, since I was really interested in, in using these images again, but I was actually commissioned to make a work that was um, specific to, uh, this museum in Toronto, to Toronto, I uh, basically went back to those same image sources and reused them and actually elongated them and added to them and um, created this uh, very long scroll. So each of these scrolls are 90 feet long or more. One of them is 120 feet long and the other one is I think 140 feet long. And um, when and I also obviously scaled it so that when you were just walking out on the ground, if you look below, you could see the um, the planes, um, the fighter jets. So in reality, like that airplane is like quite this big um, yeah, on, on the scale. Uh, yeah, so what else was I going to say? Okay, yeah, so this is the Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor. And um, I actually thought that this presentation, I wanted to show you the source image. So that entire scroll is created using this one source image um, that kind of shows the sonic boom of um, the, the Raptor. And then it's basically repeated thousands upon thousands of times until I get like the pattern that I am looking to achieve. For this installation, I wanted to kind of create this mood of um, night time, like morning to night, so dawn to dusk and the changing colors of the sky. And so I also overlaid a color. So again, you have this pattern in your exhibition, but I um, kind of shifted some of the colors within it. And these are the Thunderbirds. And this is the F-18 Hornet that's used in the third scroll, which I don't think is in your exhibition. Um, I have so many of these, by the way. I, I really enjoy making them, and it's almost, a, sadly, it's almost a meditation for me. I sit and I work with the files over and over again, and um, it's, it's surprisingly very therapeutic for me to work in this way. And this is the source image for the third scroll, which you see as the... Um, the light blue in this area and here. And that's the back view of them all. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to your questions. So if you'd like to put any of them in the chat in the meanwhile, please do. If anything is coming up, uh, then we can refer back to them. So next, I'd like to talk about a project called Light Times. Uh, it is an installation that um, is, again, about photography, but in a different way. So this is a project that I made in 2019. 
And when you look down this corridor, when you enter the gallery, everything is black and white. And I wanted to create a, a moment uh, where you thought that once you enter, you thought that you're coming into a black and white photography exhibition. But then when you go to the other side of the installation and you look backward, it's all the pieces are in color. And so this work came out of a moment in our history where we were really like in the news and everywhere and in the media, there was a lot of talk about post-truth politics. And I wanted to talk about how photo photographs and photographers manipulate images. So beyond processing images, let's say making sure that the color is matches my skin tone or that, um, you know, if it's a sunset, it's a little bit more maybe vibrant. Um, I was interested in thinking about how an image can tell us something different because of its caption, because of the way it's framed, because of the newspaper it's printed in, because of the context that it's made. And so for the project, um, I collaborated with a number of people and actually um, there was a soundscape and a scent that I mentioned at the very beginning. And I won't go into it too much quite right now. But what was really important for me was to collaborate with people who use the medium of photography in different ways and bring their voices to the table. So for the project, what I used for a set of five uh, photographs that I had made as a undergraduate student in the dark room in the color dark room and all they were was different colors of light recorded on photographic paper and they were completely abstract there was no camera used in it and there was no film used in it it was simply the recording of light on paper and why I wanted to use these was that at first I thought okay I want to use a picture of war or a picture of a child running down the street but everything seemed to have with it so much connotations and so much um, meaning that I didn't know what to do with so I thought why not just demonstrate how photography can be manipulated on this very fundamental level of line and color not even shape you know, so basically, um, what I did was take these five, I took these five images and I played with them as much as I could in order to make them look different, basically. So this first piece, um, is one, a piece that I, it's called, um, fold, but it's in a, in a way for me, um, an ode to Photoshop. So all I did was copy and paste different parts of the image onto itself. Um, I blurred it, but I used all the tools that one would use in analog photography, everything that's part of the vernacular and the language of um, original analog photography that has now survived and has been placed into Photoshop, the software for image manipulation. And this is a detail of it that shows, for example, how I made it look pixely in certain spots. Um, that same photograph was used in other ways. Um, so here on the left, I simply just held the piece of paper and folded it to show how um, it is something that's in two dimensions and doesn't really exist in three dimensions. Then I took this picture and repeated it and overlaid it and then made it into four to talk about how something changes once you place it within the language of pattern um, and repetition. I took the piece and printed it exactly as was straight on the uh, aluminum and then rolled it so to create a curve. But I also flipped it 90 degrees. All of a sudden it's 
instead of a portrait, it becomes a landscape. So there was a lot of stuff that, in terms of just bringing it out. But what was really the most uh, interesting part for me that I got most excited about once the start work started coming in was the collaborations between myself and the other artists working in different modes and technologies of photography. So the print on the left here was made by Bob Carney, and it's a tricolor gum print, and I'm sure most people haven't heard of it. Um, it's uh, one of the early, or it is the earliest form of color photography, and it was made uh, by basically um, paint, painting layers onto a photographic kind of reproduction, and then printing them. So when Bob Carney looked at mine, he, for one thing, flipped it. And then his eye decided that this purple was what he needed to do. And that's what he did. And, and then I asked a um, printmaker to work on uh, uh, the piece. And he decided that he wanted to show the way that... Um, printing process works and so he created a half tone scale that was really what well, big circles so that you could see it and these are the the details of the two pieces just going back to the original that's what the original looked like i also made the original as a sculpture and then this is one of the other ones you can kind of see it in the very background where it becomes for me about pixelization and the reduction of information uh, when you use a reduced let's say um, color palette uh, here it is kind of holding itself up as a with a black and white image this is another piece where uh, this work is inverted and then placed upon itself so it kind of draws almost a curtain, but to speak to how something looks so different depending on your perspective or how you visualize it. These are tintypes where I played with the focus steps uh, when taking the pictures. Um, on the left, uh, this is my ode to 35 millimeter film, uh, which was very important for the history of photography. And so it's made into that proportion. On the right, I had, I worked with an amazing artist named Mike Robinson, who made a daguerreotype with me and walked me through the process. He did 99 percent of the work <laughs> and I was there really um, as an artistic uh, support but what was really interesting was to see how that single image can transform and have its own emotion depending on how each image was processed or manipulated and changed this is an installation shot and finally, um, I think this is the last piece that I want to show from this project was in the lenticular work that I made where I used one of these photographs and I simply changed the hue um, and the saturation over and over again in order to create something completely different. What was cool about it is that because it's a lenticular, depending on where you stood, this is the same work of art, um, you would see a different image. So it became completely clear that no matter who you are, you, you know, we all have amazing, beautiful pasts and histories. And through those experiences and um, lenses, we perceive the world differently. And so for me, this was a very kind of symbolic way or a uh, way of talking about how depending on where you stand, if you're on this, on this platform or slightly over, you'll see the world differently. And to kind of um, be aware of that as an important element. 
So I'm going to say thank you so very much. Uh, I'm going to conclude the talk here and open it up to questions. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot to chat about. And I can go back and also show you some neural work if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Sanas. Uh, there are already a few questions in the chat. Are you able to see your chat? I'm just Otherwise. opening it up. Great. OK, because I can also read them otherwise. Well, maybe you can decide which one we should start with. Uh, well, first, Linda was asking how long it takes to create one image, and that was when you were showing the repetition works that that question popped up. Okay, great. Um, sometimes weeks, um, most of the time, like a couple months. Sometimes I go back to things like over years, uh, but usually it's just like a few weeks. And not including all the time it takes to collect those images, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that, like, exactly. I mean, you know, I think as artists, we're all always thinking about something. And just, like, you know, or like, you know, when I found that Paris Hilton image, I don't know, it just really spoke to me at that moment. Um, and I, you know, I just like, I keeping that Paris Hilton somewhere. And then I found a match for it, like, a while later. So that happens too, right? So, and then sometimes I can't find something that I've downloaded and I'm like, oh no, where did it go? I remember it, but I don't know where I logged it. So, <laughs> so staying on the repetition or the pattern works, uh, I was asking, uh, do you try to create certain shapes within your patterns that are reminiscent of representational things? Uh, like for example, I thought it looked interesting the way that the imagery is very mechanical, things like jets, but then uh, it could start to look like organic growth of things like fractals or plants, flowers, uh, which, you know, has a kind of an ironic contradiction in that way. Yes. I mean, for sure. So basically, um, one part that I left out of the talk, which was I didn't want to like talk for too long at once, uh, is that these patterns, uh, they're symmetrical and, uh, and in particular it's a vertical symmetry right and so this is what we are humans are in a way designed to experience so um in the same way that our bodies are you know vertically and symmetrically formed so is our brain so we have the two hemispheres and in fact, there's been tons of studies where it shows that we will much more likely remember a sh pattern or words that are um, mirrored uh, on the vertical axis versus the horizontal axis. And so um, through the process of evolution, um, this type of uh, aesthetic and physical pattern of shapes have been selected for. And so uh, it's, it's not, it's very normal for us to actually find it very beautiful. And um, if we look at many different cultures from Celtic patterns to Islamic patterns to Chinese patterns, like all over the world, um, symmetry is used as a form of beauty. I mean, even in terms of elections, um, I'm sure you guys have heard that like sometimes uh, pre presidents win elections depending on how symmetrical their faces are or their numbers increase so forth because of that. And so I wanted to use um, Islamic ornamentation patterns specifically to reference um, the kind of dichotomy between East and West. But I also wanted it to be beautiful. I wanted to create something that we were drawn to and to realize perhaps that there is, um, there is beauty in other cultures that we don't know much about. Does that answer your question at all? Yes, and just as a, as a side thing, I also wondered if you're relating the repetition or the kind of mass quantity of those images to ideas about mass production or um, thinking about, uh, I guess, economy or um, thinking about like the mass production of, of our of many things that we buy, yeah. things like that. 
Yeah, I think I was really thinking about econ economies of scale in terms of like volume and, and um, uh, multiplicity. So not so much in terms of that kind of production, but that kind of consumption. So digital consumption, you know, seeing um, one image licensed and used over and over again um, and uh, wondering why uh, this particular image that is to define a particular event is the chosen one. Um, how come we don't have as many perspectives as were perhaps cameras on the ground on that day? Have you ever watched people interact with your works to see if sometimes people miss the images? Because I did notice that sometimes at the uh, at the opening, there were a couple of people who just thought it was like decoration or, you know, they see it on fabric and they think of it as more like a decorative design and they didn't look closely and didn't notice the images. So it's interesting how with the repetition, some people could miss the imagery. I think, um, so it really depends on the scale that I work at. And I kind of mentioned that, that I've changed sometimes the scale depending on the distance that the viewer can get to the work. But sometimes I do like it being a little bit of a treat. And, and so I want to pull someone in only to shock them in terms of what is actually the subject that they're looking at. And this, I've seen this happen for sure. Um, I had an exhibition in the United uh, Arab Emirates and uh, I had like this very fancy sheikh with his entourage come through the ga uh, that gallery to see the work. I was not allowed to say hello. I had to stand back and he was given the tour. And um, of course, the subject was about the Arab Spring. And he loved the work, he was talking to the gallery dealer, wanted to buy it, then got too close. <laughs> he literally jolted it, <laughs> fell almost back, and walked right past the rest of the pieces. <laughs> Not, yeah. Wow, so, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that happen. I like it when that happens. <laughs> right, it is. A but, yeah. That, that's actually somewhat of a theme in many works in the show where some of the imagery might be hidden at first within the patterns of or the course. layers of the work. And so it, people, when people take time to look at the work, they're more rewarded. You know, they start to find more things the more that they look at it. Um, and so th that is somewhat of a theme in the show. Uh, Juliana, do you want to ask your question or? Oh, okay. <laughs> so Juliana is asking, uh, she said, I'm curious about the transition to silk in the Not Elsewhere series. The fact that the pieces are so delicate, it reminded me of how fragile political situations, relationships can be and how fast they can change and deter. That's really beautiful. I actually love that. Um, yes. I mean, I really wanted to think about the subtleness of it, how, I mean, I love air shows. I know it's probably not the right thing to say, but I find the, the awe-inspiring um, magnitude of humanity being displayed uh, fantastical. And I wanted to juxtapose it to that, like, that kind of very tactile, um, soft um, uh, material uh, of silk, but the fact that you've uh, kind of linked it to the fragility of political um, negotiations or situations, I think is, um, it's really poetic and very, very beautiful. I, if you don't mind, I would like to continue <laughs> thinking it within that framework. You can, yeah, because for us, when we were installing, I mean, your pieces were some of the most delicate and the more I visited the, the gallery and the more I got really to enjoy your pieces, the more I know it's like, these are so fragile. And I mean, I'm from Colombia, I'm in South America. So I've been through some political situations that, you know, we know that in the spur of a moment, someone said the wrong thing and you have a conflict. 
Yeah. So that's how I started looking at your at your pieces. It was like, well, I don't want to conflict with your gallery, <laughs> but but that's how I approach them. You know, we have these beautiful images when we got close, we recognized the the fighter jets. And with that same caution, we were dealing with your pieces. So that's how I started making the connection. So good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so, I see another comment that's yeah. really nice <laughs> from Rita. Rita, did you want to expand on that at all or uh, ask anything? For, it's, a nice, it's a great comment, arms proliferation versus image pro proliferation. Otherwise, I was curious if you, because you have some very different uh, series. And so like you have your more abstract work and your work with, with more of the imagery. Um, do you work back and forth between series or do you kind of put all your investment into just one series at a time? Yeah, no, I like having multiple projects on the go, although it's been very difficult since COVID, to be honest, to have multiple things. Um, I find that I, I, in order for me to like kind of work through the tough part of a project, <laughs> I need to have another one uh, in the starting phases that's somewhat my very um kind of favorite phase of doing the research and the creative kind of outpouring of it but yeah i usually it doesn't matter how big my space is even now that i'm working from home i have a couple of tables so i can have a couple of areas where i'm like tinkering with different ideas or even if i have post-it notes on one door versus the other door <laughs> kind of thing yeah Yeah, so um, I do can show you one more project if you like, or if there's some more questions. Um, I was just gonna, you asked me to expand on that. You yes, were talking yes. about, um, she asked the question about uh, economies and if this related to the economy. And it just made me think about uh, the economy of war and the, the mass production and repetition of, you know, all the, uh, all the things you need to be in um, a state of war for the last 20 years yeah. and how also the proliferation of images um, and how that has become like the newest um, area that a lot of countries are using in their um, in war. So I guess we don't really need to have as many fighter planes as we do um, doctored images and deep fake videos that are proliferated everywhere. Yeah, I think that's really beautifully said. Uh, some of these images, Rita, that I used, um, again, this is a little bit older work, uh, were actually images um, that were advertising shots, like, for example, made by Lockheed Martin or um, Stab. Uh, who were trying to sell their fighter jets to different countries, right? So they do all this like really fancy shots where like they'll take like a Gripen out to the Chilean Andes and it's flying and then they have a second craft that's flying alongside it and it's being photographed at the sunset and the mountains in the background. And you just think about like the production that has just gone into... Um, creating the language around these like metal bodies um and what the destruction that can come out of them just so that they can have more sales right so um and but today as you said so astutely um war is quite quite different it's changing it's shifting um i don't think that uh, you know drones and um death is still occurring uh, in different parts of the world, just becoming more and more remote. And our relationship to it is becoming less and less um, clear. So um, I think I think what you just said <laughs> might be where I need to head my research next. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for the reminder <laughs> to think about that. Yeah, very important. 
Well, I was fascinated by the images you found of the soldiers with uh, the coffins, uh, you know, that were censored with the censor bars, uh, mm. that the censor bars, you know, took away the individuality uh, or, you know, knowing who the people were. So it actually kind of dehumanized the people in a way. Um, and I think, I thought that that was, that was interesting that it totally, you know, depersonalized the people in the same way that military can also kind of dehumanize people in a way or militaristic, um, you know, thinking where yeah. the mass serves, you know, the, 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 those in power. Um, but anyway. No, yeah, for the, sure. I mean, that um, decision to uh, redact uh, photo photographs, uh, it, it was established by George Bush senior in 1991 during the Gulf War. And it was like uh, the first time that they decided to stop releasing uh, photographs that were taken by military photographers to the press. Um, and I think it was kind of like uh, the legislature like was written so that it wasn't saying that we're not letting the public see these images, but we're going to redact them to a, to a significance where um, it renders them almost like useless, right? And so um, there was good reason to to it because they wanted to make sure that um, every military personnel being represented in each image uh, was consulted uh, uh, to give release for that image or their families. So it just basically made it impossible to print those type of pictures in the newspaper, which was, to me, I feel like the outcome that they wanted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, the facelessness of it is, it, it's, I think, quite scary. And perhaps one of the reasons why I, we have so many um, uh, uh, conspiracy uh, kind of feelings of conspiracy because you know uh, in terms of humanity we want to understand uh, our brains are set up in a way for so that uh, we can try to comprehend the overarching like framework of our lives and when it's so complicated and so manipulated by so many different governments at the same time it, uh, it's really necessary for humans to try to find the thread within it all. And I think the facelessness really makes it uh, difficult to do that. Um, you guys have a really great crew here. Great questions. I'd still love to see one more project for you. You said you still had something else. Oh, prepared. no. Otherwise, I... otherwise we, can, we can finish up. Do, does anyone else have, have questions or that's being shy? <laughs> I love the conversation. I prefer that to show more work. Um, how about if I show stuff and we can talk over it? Great. Okay, and so it's a quick one. This is a project. Oh wait, I'm not sharing my screen, right? Okay, All right. I I can do this. Okay, thank you. We go to the next slide. And uh, this is a piece that I actually collaborated with, with my brother, Mani Mazinani. He's also an artist. Our parents are extremely proud. <laughs> um, and uh, he specializes in sound art and um, film and video. And this is a piece that we made for an exhibition in San Francisco. And it's titled Dark Sight. And it's a sculpture that has to do with photography, which is why I wanted to show you. And it has to do in a way with camouflage too, because what happens is each panel um, has its own color. And when you look through it, it basically taints or alters uh, your perspective. So for me, these gels stood in for biases that we have in our world. It's again, like the perspectives that we kind of get brought up with, right? But what happens is that at, for, at the beginning, these, these layers look beautiful and they're colored like, you know, pink uh, rose colored sunglasses, let's say. 
but once they start to overlap, um, they start to kind of lose information. So it becomes more complicated and the dimensionality of it starts to fall apart. So here you can see the blue and the yellow have gone together. They make green, but you can hardly see what's through it. And so at the very end, the, the piece, when you stand 100% in front of it and you look through all the layers of the panels, you don't see anything at all. You see this just blackness, and which is why it's titled Dark Sight. And for Mani and I, for us, um, it was a kind of a representation of the limitation to uh, how many, uh, to lack of clarity, <laughs> let's say. So to this kind of camouflaging that literally happens when information is redacted or reduced or taken away over and over again. So I thought that was something that was relevant to the exhibition that I wanted to share. Oh, you're muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> do you have any uh, projects you want to share coming up or um, do you have any, any shows coming up that you're working on? Yeah, I am working on a really big project right now. I'm very excited about it. Um, it's for uh, San Francisco. I am making a public art piece for it. And um, it is going to be a five by 50 foot sculpture that will be over Market Street, which is like one of, like it's our main street. And um, is going to be made out of metal and glass and uh, will shift in color um, due to the due to the uh, lighting conditions and I'll just show you this is the material I'm working with so um, you can see yourself in there Lisa but so this um, this is not the best lighting to show you but so this this glass it changes color depending on the angle of light and it changes color of the cast shadow depending on the angle of light. Um, so I'm very excited <laughs> and it'll be very big and kind of monumental and kind of up for probably like 30 years. So I That's can't wait. Definitely <laughs> exciting. Thank you. you said Thank you. in, did you say San Francisco or? In, yeah, in San Francisco, California. Great, something to look forward to then. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you when it's some pictures and it's done. We should be done um, in a few months. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you to those of you who, uh, you know, added to the conversation and make it even more interesting. And um, thank you, Sanas, for all the work you put into your presentation and for being part of this show. Is it definitely uh, was an important contribution to the theme and, and to the, the visual of the installation as well. Um, so any, any last questions from anyone before we sign off? Okay, so uh, since this was recorded, we can share it you know, in the future and um, we'll be sure to send you the link if you don't mind it being shared publicly, um, then hopefully we can have people continue to, to hear more about your work that way. And I, I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, Lisa and Sanas for this amazing conversation. For those of you that are interested in learning more about programming at Pompano Beach, uh, you can go to pompanobeacharts.com or dot org, I'm sorry, pompanobeacharts.org. And that's where, if you look for the exhibition, I believe that that's where this conversation will be posted. But I believe since you register, we can also send you a link, uh, download the event, right? Um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was fantastic. Thank you, Sanas. It's so wonderful to meet you this way. <laughs> you too. And, thank uh, you so much. If anyone's in the area and hasn't gotten a chance to see the exhibit, as we mentioned at the beginning, it is on view through September 24th. And uh, we will also have a print catalog coming out that you can pick up. Um, it'll be it'll probably be 
just after the show closes that it will have it um, at Bailey Contemporary Arts that you can pick up a free copy of that as well. Uh, and I'll send you some copies as well. So <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's been such a pleasure working with you. I, I feel very um, grateful. Great. Okay, well, uh, look forward to seeing more from you in the future. So yeah. everyone have a good evening. <laughs> good night.